presentation. Um, I think it'll be a good resource for as we get started in the school year. So if you don't feel comfortable with your face being shown, you can turn off your camera, but the session will be recorded. Cool, so a couple of upcoming opportunities from our office before we get going. Um, just wanted to let you guys know that our Youth Leadership Council, it's gonna be in its fifth year this year and we're open for recruiting. So we're looking for high school students at New York City schools. Uh, we're gonna be meeting once a month on Thursdays, the second Thursday of the month, um, running from November to June, working on everything from helping to plan our Youth Climate Summit to working on school-based climate action plans. So it's a really great opportunity um, to learn more about climate action, sustainability, how you can make a change in your school community. So please um, tell any of your high school students to come apply and join us. And then also our first in-person training of the year is on October 12th. It's for teachers, fifth through ninth grade teachers. It's all about air quality monitoring and what, has, what that has to do with environmental justice. Um, really as part of the training, you get an air quality monitor. So it's teaching you how to use that equipment how to do the data analysis behind it and how to apply it in your school to learn about why air quality is so important and how you guys can start taking action in your school around air quality. So come join us for this training. And then as a reminder, um, check out our sustainability hub for lots of upcoming opportunities, resources for your classroom, partner resources, grant opportunities, lots of good information here. It's a great place to get started to learn more about the things that we're doing as an office and all the wonderful things that our partners do. So without further ado, I wanna hand it off to Cafeteria Culture and Grow NYC to talk about all the wonderful climate action we can take in the cafeteria. I think a lot of times we think about um, the cafeteria as places for recycling and waste reduction, which obviously there are huge places that we can make that kind of action, but making the connection to climate change and to climate action, I think is really important. And a good place to do that is in the cafeteria because there's a lot of opportunities um, where we're interacting with single use plastics, you know, how we think of how single use plastics are produced, what they're made out of, where those things go, when we dispose of them, a lot of great connections with food waste, food production, all the greenhouse gases that are emitted through that whole process. So it's a good place to kind of look at climate action in a different way. Um, so I'm super excited. Please welcome um, Rhonda and Nicholas from Cafeteria Culture and Daniil and Kate from Grow NYC. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Daniil. Hi everybody, my name is Daniil Foster Russell. Uh, it is a real pleasure to see all of you here and um, we are so excited to talk to you about uh, climate action in the cafeteria. I'm here with the director of our program, Kate Wimsat, who um, uh, hopefully you'll unmute and um, introduce yourself. Hi, yes, we're excited to be here and to present on um, what we will be doing this year and ways that you can take climate action in the cafeteria. So I think we're sharing our screen right now. Yes, and I am in the middle of doing that right perfect. now. You guys let me know when you see my screen and it's neat, looks the way I want it to. Nice, okay, perfect. All right, so um, we are from Grow NYC. Uh, the name of our program is Zero Waste Schools, and um, we are just one of the programs here at Grow NYC. Uh, and I think we love to start all of our, our sessions just helping people understand the work that we do and how it fits in with the mission of our organization. Uh, I think Grow NYC wants to protect the environment, it wants to create green spaces and help people stay healthy and give them the opportunity to make a positive impact. And the work that we do here at Zero Waste Schools feeds into that. We work in schools, we help schools get their recycling and composting up and running. Um, we are on the ground outreach, engagement, education folks. Um, we work really hard and we are very passionate. Um, today, we wanted to talk to you guys about um, the curbside composting expansion. Um, and we'll explain what that is. Um, we wanna talk to you about how our program is helping in that expansion. And then we wanna switch into uh, 
climate action, which is about reducing food waste in the cafeteria. And then uh, we would love to present a little bit of uh, a really cool resource that we have and give you access to it. It's our food waste audit. Okay, Kate, Kate and I will, the way that we do this is that one of us will jump in and, and talk. That's just, you know, we, it's very sort of loose and easygoing. Um, of course, if you wanna ask us questions, we would love for you to ask them at the end, but if it's really pertinent to the slide, feel free to like, raise your hand and we'll let you in. Um, so now I would love for folks to um, turn on their mics and raise their hand. And if you can answer this question, um, what percentage of uh, school waste is actually compostable. And when I say compostable, I'm talking about food waste, food soil paper, food scraps. Go ahead and put that in the chat or raise a hand or just unmute and, and pop in. We're, we're informal. Okay, 90%. Best Metcalf thinks it's 90%, 85%. So some of you, some of you really know uh, percentages. We're talking about just the food waste and food sold paper. What percentage of school waste, food waste, and food soil paper? I rec recognize some of the names in this, and some of you I have do. really, yeah, you know, you know the answers to this. <laughs> Students say forty-five percent, Miss Borger's class. All right, I'm going to reveal right. the answer, Kate. <clears throat> so, fifty-one percent. Uh, who said that? Liz Colbert. Liz. Yes, yes. Fifty-one percent of the waste that comes out of school buildings. Um, is compostable or organic waste. And then 35% of it is recyclable. And so we see that as an incredible opportunity. The work that we do here, we do work on um, organics and on recyclables. And so that is 80, we, we think it's 86% of the waste coming out of schools that is div divertible waste. And by that, we mean waste that uh, we could prevent uh, going to landfills. So, um, now we wanna switch in to talk about what is curbside composting. Um, okay, jump in anytime, you wanna jump in? Sure, or? Okay. sure. So, and we'll talk a little bit about the, um, about the expansion as well. So curbside composting um, in New York City, we're really fortunate in that the sanitation department will come right with a truck right to the curb and pick up um, compost from um, many of our schools. There have been over 800 schools enrolled in curbside composting since 2013. And in this next two years, all schools across the system will be uh, enrolled and received curbside composting. So it will be collected from all DOE schools um, by DSNY um, uh, truck services, which is really exciting. We know that schools across the entire system have been waiting for this to happen. And it's a great partnership with the Department of Education and the Department of Sanitation um, to bring this service to schools. And then we come in and we provide, our role in it is that we provide the education and outreach and engagement to schools to really help them, give them the support that they need to be able to participate fully in the programming. But the goal of um, curbside composting is to be able to remove all of those um, compostable waste and instead of sending them to landfill, send them to facilities where they get turned into a nutrient soil rich amendment that, um, uh, a nutrient rich soil amendment that um, can then be used to help us um, enhance parks, street trees, gardens, farms, um, so many beneficial uses of compost. Um, one of them being that, uh, especially around schools and in our neighborhoods, they can help to, uh, it can help to reduce um, rodent and pest issues because we're removing all of that, you know, putrescent weight food waste um, from the bags on the curb and putting them into containers so that we're reducing access to food sources for pest populations. But there's so many other benefits of compost. Um, I think we've got a couple of slides of this. Um, for schools, the benefit being that the compost collection happens five days a week. And so those materials would be collected daily from schools. So as the waste is separated in, um, in the cafeteria, that food gets put out every, that waste gets put out every single day. It's collected, it keeps all of that stinky stuff um, in the trash from um, being stored in the school and, and is removed. Um, so that collection is increased to five times a day and recycle, recycling collection is on an alternate schedule. Many of you know this already. Paper is Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, with the other MGPC recycling happening on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yeah, we're really excited about this for schools and, and particularly um, dealing with the rodent issue. I mean, we live in New York City, we know that's a big deal and just getting more services. Like, you know, schools always want, they always need more and being able to 
message that to schools and actually be able to deliver that to schools, we're very excited. And then there's some compost benefits, right? And so this is about climate action and how food waste relates to climate action. So we really wanted to connect that. Why do we care about um, <clears throat> diverting school food waste from landfills? Well, because it reduces the greenhouse gas like methane, particularly methane um, that is uh, that contributes to climate change. It helps prevent soil erosion. Um, you know, it cleans water by chopping heavy metals. Um, and it provides healthy food for plants and it raises awareness about food waste as a global problem. So it's 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 a very interconnected issue. And it, you know, we were talking about benefits for the schools, but you know, New York City has over 1,800 schools. And if we're able to divert as much of this waste as possible, we will be able to make a really huge impact, not only for our city, but for uh, our country and, 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 and food waste as a global problem as well. So we're invested in, um, in dealing with this problem. We're really excited that we're getting to expand or be part of the expansion for, uh, for diverting food waste from landfills. And I just want to jump in there a little bit as, as well, just for the um, the reducing greenhouse gases. So as we know, um, when food when food is um, transported to landfill, it's one of the heaviest parts of um, our waste stream, and so the heaviness in the trucks is um, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation. Then when it's in the landfill and then covered mm -hmm. over, it as it breaks down, it it does generate the methane gas, which is the most potent um, greenhouse gas. Um, that can that it's more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, so in the landfill, it, it generates greenhouse gases. But then the flip side of that is the product that it produces. When we take all of those food scraps, food waste, food soil paper, and um, through the process of um, managed decomposition, turning it in, into compost, all of those soil benefits that we get from the compost can actually help with um, drawing down of carbon from the atmosphere. So removing the problem of, of, of you know dealing with food waste and and um, and food in the in the um, landfill is one one benefit of it, but the generation of compost that can help with regenerative agricultural practices um, is is just the other side of it. It's it's kind of a double bonus when we when we deal with food waste. Yeah. Um, and there are other you know we wanted to sort of frame composting in a larger context um, when it comes to food waste and. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we, we, we understand that we are dealing with compost, which is like uh, one, two, three, four, the, the fifth thing in the hierarchy of food recovery that we are meant to be doing, right? There are other things as well, other key actions that we can take to address this problem. Um, and I'm gonna just go, I mean, I know you can see it, but I would love to just read it out. People read it, people learn in different ways. Um, source reduction, so reducing the volume and surplus of, um, of excess food, feeding hungry people. Um, there's no, we know if we walk outside, we can find someone who might be in need of a, of a decent meal, uh, feeding animals and industrial uses and then composting. If we're able to do, um, those four actions before we get to composting, we can really make a huge impact in, the, in this particular issue. I'm gonna toss to Kate so she can add some more here. Sure, so um, you know, those, those areas that we're, we're talking about, source reduction and getting food to people who, to, who need food, um, that's all actions that can take place before the food comes into our hands. So we're talking when we're, or, or actions that we can take when we do have excess food, but those are sort of like the higher level farms, industrial farms, local farms, um, food distributors. And even when we're in a school talking about um, school food, OFNS is taking action to reduce food waste by um, batch cooking and, and doing uh, techniques that aren't cooking too much food for the, for the school. So there's so many steps that we can take before we end up with food that we have to take care of or get rid of um, and, and use those last two options, composting or landfill. Those are the two options that have been available to us um, in schools. And what we'll be doing hopefully in the next two years is eliminating that last one. No food will be going to the landfill. That's just, that's just the ultimate waste, sending yeah. food to the landfill. So uh, we're excited. We, we always work with our students to take steps before composting becomes what we consider the last option for food. Um, but, um, but we do know that we have so much food in the cafeteria that we have to take care of a lot of it through um, putting it into that brown bin, which I think is what we're going to get into next. It is. Uh, thanks for putting in what OFNS means there, Eliza. Um, go ahead, Kate. 
All right, so this is what we're talking about in schools, the brown bin. Uh, just a show of hands or, or a, um, if anyone can say if they don't have the brown bin in their school, because I think at this point we're at majority brown bin. And I know there are a few people who are starting on October 17th. So we're really excited to be working with you, especially to be bringing this program um, on, on board in your school. But the brown bin in schools, that's where students can begin to take action by um, putting all of their, most of, what they have on their, their lunch plate can go into the um, into that brown bin, especially after Rhonda speaks about what, what they're doing in the cafeteria, take away the plastics, and we've got an almost entirely compostable um, food, food tray and plate. Um, and so, uh, you know, students separate all of their materials, um, the last bin being the food waste bin, um, and that food waste, that's a, what a beautiful food waste collection in schools looks like. It's, yeah. There's no contamination in there. This is what we work with schools to get to. Those um, utensils that you see in there that look like plastic, those are actually compostable utensils that um, DOE Office of uh, the Office of Food and Nutrition Services with the Office of Sustainability and some other um, food, the, the food um, coalition across the country have worked hard to get these compostable utensils into schools across the country. And hopefully it, it's some of the larger systems, hopefully that trickles down across to smaller systems. And this gets taken, and this is a picture from um, Staten Island, our Staten Island facility, it gets taken and turned into this beautiful, dark, rich nutrient um, uh, soil. Um, nutrient amendment for soil. So um, this food in the cafeteria is going places. It is being turned into something. It is, um, it is, we are taking action by participating in this program. So we go into schools, we help schools with brown bins set up in the cafeteria. Um, there's a whole sorting station and that's what this, this picture here is. Um, students in the classrooms out there, do you recognize this from your cafeteria? I know many of you um, from those classes and I'm not sure if Karen's class has left yet, um, but this is something that should be very familiar with you. And what we're really excited about working with students in the schools is setting up leadership teams and having school, um, having green teams or student monitor teams help other students in the cafeteria know what goes into each of the bins. Um, so we do a lot of education in schools uh, to get everyone participating and make sure that this is running smoothly for the students, for the um, staff that maintain the bins and so that it gets out to the curb uh, and can be collected by DSNY and made into that beautiful compost. Um, Bronx schools, October 17th is the first day that this collection will happen in your schools, but we'll be working with you prior to that to help get everyone in the building um, aware of the program and um, ready and excited for it to be, uh, to be starting on that date. Yeah, I really, if anyone here is from the Bronx, I, I just wanna let folks know that if you see one of our education and engagement leads, you know, in your building, uh, work with us or, you know, give us some information that would help us uh, move the school forward. Um, we're very excited to be going into the Bronx. Okay, we've got a, uh, this is a question for, for it's, a, it's a rhetorical question. We just want to let you guys talk about a little bit, just wanted to talk a little bit about how we help schools um, and how we will be helping schools in the Bronx. Uh, we provide education, educational opportunities to raise awareness, right? So that will that can look like cafeteria instruction. It can look like lessons in the classroom. It could look like workshops with the custodial staff. It could look like um, workshops with the kitchen staff. We train and then we train again and then we train again. If a school needs to be trained a third time, we have no problem doing it because we want everyone to know exactly how to do things. And if people want to work with us, we're going to work with them. Um, so the picture on the left here is a couple of kids working on um, a, uh, a waste food waste audit in their cafeteria. Um, and uh, that material that they're using, we'll, we'll preview that material in a little bit, but that is our food waste audit. Um, this is one of our um, leads giving a, um, a, a worm bin workshop that is real life. Uh, compost and she's pointing to a, a worm there and look I love this photo because these kids are just so <laughs> they just are so engaged with their um, with their tools getting ready to learn about how to be uh, environmental stewards and these are a group of high school students also doing a food waste audit in their cafeteria so we go to the point where the food is being um, disposed of because you know we want folks to be able to take action in their cafeteria um, that's where the food comes in and that's where we need to be able to address the problem, right? This is our, um, our colleague, Jackie, um, who actually has designed the, these numbers on the bins that really help kids understand the sequence of how to use these bins. Um, 
they first need to pour their liquids, then they need to dispose of their metal glass, plastics and cartons, then they get rid of their soft plastics and then everything else on that tray, on that compostable tray should be compostable. You, you don't see the brown bin on uh, further left, but it's there and it's numbered four. Um, and then this is another one of our team um, teammates, uh, Sam Goldberg, working in the cafeteria again um, with students about how to use the bins, you know, why it's important to use these bins, why it's important to be um, thinking about putting their waste where it belongs. Um, and so we want them to understand exactly, you know, that they are uh, empowered to be able to make a change in their school first and before they start thinking about making changes in other places. Um, another thing that we do is we uh, help establish and support uh, sustainability leadership. So that is about working with students and also working with adults. So we have uh, a, a resource that we give to schools called um, sustainability count, school sustainability councils. We understand that like it is really hard to make change in schools if it's just one person doing the work, right? So we encourage schools to first of all, um, you know, get their communication lines open and talking to each other. So we invite key stakeholders like the principal, the sustainability coordinator, coordinator the custodian engineer, uh, the OFNS um, manager or the leader, the heavy duty man, um, or heavy duty person, just anyone who touches that waste and has a role to play in getting it out of the building in the right way. We want them invited in to conversations and thinking about how they can play a role. In, in this change. And we also love to help kids uh, access contests um, and secure funding, you know, to do their projects and, and push their program okay. even further than waste. And I'm just More gonna pictures. jump in here. We've, we've got just a few minutes before we uh, kick it over to cafeteria culture. So um, there are a couple of questions in the, um, oh, Eliza just answered the question. <laughs> I was gonna go and answer, but Eliza just answered the question. So we're, um, thank you for, for addressing but that, Eliza. Please add uh, on too. <laughs> sure. Uh, just uh, just to let you know that uh, it, once the service comes to the school, the school must participate. And so we work with every single um, um, stakeholder group in the school, especially with the custodial stuff, because they are um, a key key member of getting the waste um, from from that has been sorted from the places that were sorted to the curb. Um, but what we do is we really encourage them and let them know that we are working with students and with staff as well, because oftentimes custodial staff have a tricky issue, and that they're responsible for getting the materials separated to the curb, but the school hasn't yet. Um, come on board or, or develop the habits necessary to have that separated waste. So um, uh, yeah, we work with everyone to help bring everybody on board. Uh, I think we can kind of skip ahead a little bit, Daniil, and go to the food waste um, food waste section, just so we can, um, Daniil's, Daniil's skipping over a couple of nice slides right there that show um, the way we look at food in the cafeteria. It all goes into the compost bin, but we're really helping students to identify whether the food that they're throwing away was recoverable food, non-recoverable food, and um, identify the distinction between some terms that just kind of get used a lot, one of them being food scraps and food waste. And food scraps is the non-usable um, part of, oh, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. Food wait, scraps. wait. Let yeah. me go to food scraps. There it is. So folks can Food scraps and non-recoverable food. So food scraps are um, the unavoidable byproduct of like banana peels or, you know, even though people are now making muffins with banana peels, we can do stuff with everything, right? <laughs> we can find a way to use all waste. But in general, um, the part of the fruit or the vegetable or the food that we cannot eat, um, that would be food, food scraps. And then also non-recoverable food, that's food that has been, um, you know, a hamburger that's been half eaten and and is thrown away. It's not necessarily a food scrap, but it's non-recoverable at that point. And then we, we want them to identify whether there is recoverable food, food that was not opened or was not um, touched and is packaged and could be recovered and could be redistributed. That was the second um, line down on the food waste hierarchy for mm -hmm. um, using food to feed hungry people. So, um, um, and so, you know, we, we build that into our education. Um, and so that students begin to become aware of that and maybe begin to make different choices and um, provide them with opportunities or they come up with their own solutions to, yeah. to some of these issues, like starting a food, um, a food share table in their schools. And we've even worked with a few schools to go a little bit further. We're excited to maybe explore that a little bit more this year as it comes online that, um, to, to um, understand and, and redistribute food that could be uh, that is recoverable, but we do all of that through a waste audit. And our waste audit is really a tool that um, guides teachers and students through 
um, ident like take an investigation of your cafeteria, looking at the uh, materials that you have in your cafeteria, the items that are being thrown away, um, and measuring them because you can't change what you don't measure. Like if you don't, yes. if you don't know first what what's there, um, it's hard to to decide what you need to change. And so we're we're doing this food waste audit um, in in schools so that they can really uh, begin to quantify and get a better understanding of what's happening in. Um, in their cafeteria, and then they can come up with their own solutions. For the waste audit is part one, and then we move on to doing some more advocacy work with students where they're coming up with ideas um, of how to reduce food waste in the cafeteria and what to do with food that is recoverable, and, um, and then how to do a campaign to help their fellow students understand the issue and to have them participate in the um, in, in reducing food waste and, and in the compost program. Um, and I think there was a slide just previous to that, Danielle, that was um, just talking about the time that it takes. Uh -huh. uh, so this, it really can take as much time as um, you have to dedicate to it. We've done some really short audits with small classrooms and we've done um, longer extended audits. Um, but we, we do think that the sweet spot that we can expect students to, and teachers to contribute is two class periods. Um, one of them for kind of learning about the issues and, and set up and, and establishing roles and then one for conducting the waste audit. Um, but you could extend it further and add on the advocacy piece to that. So these materials will be shared with you. I think we will hold questions to the end of our presentation, but at this point um, we're sharing this with, with cafeteria culture. So we wanna make sure we give them their time. Um, I just wanna jump in really quickly before we toss it over. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanna say about our, our food waste audit is that if you don't have this much time, which a lot of teachers do not have, we have some adaptations in there for folks who have less time or don't have the equipment that we suggest. So um, this is just, you know, like Kate said, the maximum amount of time that we think it will take, but um, I will share the link to this um, resource so that you can go in and see our uh, adaptations and then still, you know, work with what you have, right? It's, it's not about like, you know, trying to solve it in some grandiose way. It's about using the uh, resources that are available to you and still being able to make a, um, uh, an impact. Because I think kids, uh, they they want to feel that they are in control, that they have some leadership opportunities and that they feel empowered and this op allows them to do that. And then we want their solutions to be data-driven, right? We don't want them sort of coming up with outlandish ideas. We want their ideas to be related to the problem in their school and we want it to be based on um, what they've learned. And last thing I'll say is that um, we have a type form that we give to uh, that we give to schools for free that they can use to enter their um, their data. And the lovely thing about this type form is that it um, it sort of helps students perceive the information that they have. It helps them to understand the information that they've collected, right? And so it'll tell them things like you know the amount of food food loss or food waste that you've had in your cafeteria is the same as a certain amount of carbon dioxide driven by a car. Or something like that, or by a car driven for a certain amount of miles. So um, I'll share these two links with you guys, and I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at it and use it in your schools and send us some notes on how we can improve it. Uh, let me toss it over to Cafeteria Culture. Wow, that was really incredible. I'm so excited about the work that you guys are doing and that you're going to be doing. Thank you so much um, to Kate and um, Daniil. And thank you, Eliza, for organizing this incredible opportunity to talk with people. Um, so we're Cafeteria Culture. My name's Rhonda Kaiser. I'm here with Nicholas Guillaume. If, and um, Nicholas is a new um, teacher with us. And I will um, start sharing my screen. So we... Can everybody see this? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so we're also talking about taking climate action in the cafeteria. And um, we've already talked about, it's gonna be about plastic free lunch day. It's really interesting because um, Nicholas, and we're so glad he's on the team and he just shared uh, a really great um, video with us that we were gonna work on with our youth advocates um, talking about the root word eco and it, it means home, which I guess I never really thought about. I thought about it meant the environment, but I guess that is part of your home. And so then if you think about ecology being the study of our home, but economy is the management of our home. So uh, I want to keep coming back to that. Um, and Nicholas, of course, chime in if you have anything you want to add to this. But I want to keep coming back to that because 
um, the work that we're doing, um, both of us has to do with the economy in a lot of ways. So we're cafeteria culture, we work with youth um, in schools, um, and that we put our youth in the forefront, just like Grow NYC does to lead uh, change. We are currently working for a plastic free future. We started out being called styrofoam out of schools. Um, we helped catalyze the complete elimination of styrofoam in schools. So check, we had to change our name um, to cafeteria culture. It's great to change your name. I should have named myself rich and famous, and then I could change it back to my Rhonda. Okay, so we we did a lot of data collection and data visualization um, with our students and, you know, with almost a million uh, trays every day for lunch um, stacked up. It's uh, eight and that stack would be eight and a half times higher than the Empire State Building. So visualizing data, collecting data, visualizing data and students telling their own stories. We tell students that um, good data drives policy, but it's also their stories that really helps drive the policy. So, um, so styrofoam, we started with um, uh, Trayless Tuesdays, um, working with the DOE to um, push in for Trayless Tuesdays, and now we um, helped uh, sort of urge, but the DOE created um, the Urban School Food Alliance, which is now the 18 largest urban school food districts in the country, and it drives down the prices of things like compostable trays so that it was close enough in price that you could replace the much cheaper sub, uh, government subsidized styrofoam trays for um, the compostable trays. Um, Debbie Lee, our, um, our um, fearless leader and um, executive director and founder is now right now in Baltimore speaking at the Urban School Food Alliance Conference to talk about Plastic Free Lunch Day. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. But so basically the, the goal of Plastic Free Lunch Day is to reduce as much single use plastic packaging as possible in school lunches to show, give people trayless, just like Trayless Tuesdays gave school food um, the experience of knowing what it's like to serve a meal without the um, styrofoam tray. This is the same thing. Oh, we can do it for a day. Wow, maybe we can do it for more. So we're working in partnership with DOE and uh, with uh, Office of uh, Food and Nutrition Services, but also Office of Sustainability. And we could not do it without these incredible partners. And they um, feel integral. Um, our whole relationship is integral. Um, so Plastic Free Lunch Day is a day when school lunch is prepared without plastic. It's we're trying to reduce as much plastic as possible, and, and it's also a campaign. So we have um, materials that we're developing so that teachers and green teams can use these um, to help um, create uh, momentum, awareness about plastic, and um, awareness about how easy it is to, to not use plastic. It takes a little bit of thinking because it's a, it's a shift. Um, but it's an opportunity for students to be able to take climate action right in their cafeteria. So this whole presentation is sort of a tour of, um, I'm gonna just go through it quickly, but it's the lesson. And we're just gonna talk, I'm gonna show you the features that are in it. Um, and basically it answers the question, why is plastic a problem? So um, Plastic Free Lunch Day is um, I'm just going to do this really quick video because it's um, it gives you a, a really clear overview of what it is. Can everybody hear it? I pressed the right thing. Okay. Plastic free lunching. It's a day that our school lunches will be prepared without plastic. It's a day that we can significantly reduce single use plastics in the cafeteria. No plastic! No, no plastic! Wow, oh, can kitchen staff do that? Yep, they're all on board. Plastic free lunch day started right here in this cafeteria by students from PS15 in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Yeah, we have our own plastic It's in a movie, Microplastic Madness. Students from our school asked, why don't we do it citywide? Then the school food people approved it. Now, it's coming November 2nd, Plastic Free Lunch Day, all across the USA. 
Why is the Plastic Free Lunch Day such a big deal? Is it just for one day? It is a big deal. We get to show everyone what's possible. And one Plastic Free Day can lead to more Plastic Free Days. Here are the results from Plastic Free Lunch Day that we did at PS15. We reduced plastic items by 558 items. There are about 1,800 public schools in New York City. If all 1,800 schools reduced the same amount, it would be 558 times 1,800 equals about 1 million less plastic items in New York City schools just from lunch per day. We can all come together to make this big action day a huge success. Join us! Let's do this. Okay, so thank you. That was great. Now, I don't know why I did that because now I have to follow those kids. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, can everybody still um, see my screen? Okay. All right, great. Now, so let me just go backwards. I just got ahead of myself. Okay, so at this point, we, the kids, we offer this to show the kids. So then we talk about the problem of plastic and why plastic, this is sort of the, just to contextualize it for us, this is the this is the like conflict between the economy. This is plastic is a big part of our economy, and fossil fuels are a big part of our economy. But it goes counter to uh, our home, taking care of our home, which is our health and our environment. So we don't uh, pull any punches, but because our students all have, and your students will have too, a, an action to do. Our students don't get climate grief. I'm sure that um, Grow NYC students don't either and uh, the DOE folks do. So we talk about the whole journey of plastic. It pollutes our environment and it hurts people along the way. So we have slides that illustrate that. We've um, in the notes, we also have um, even making plastic is a problem. But in the notes, we also have um, um, extra resources, articles that you can read. We're adapting them slowly and we're adding them to this. So we talk about, you know, transportation and then when it comes to the cafeteria and um, looking at single use plastics and sort of talking about what that is and then realizing that even though recycling is our best option and we should definitely put everything in the blue bin that should go there, only 8% of it's recycled. And of that 8%, about two thirds of it is sent over, overseas where they we're not sure if they're able to recycle it and it's a burden on them. So we're sending it to the global south. These folks in the global south who, who haven't, they haven't done anything, they haven't used it, they haven't received the benefit, whatever that is, of this, but they're re getting the repercussions of it. And most plastic also can only be recycled once. So we really have to, we have to just turn off the tap of the flow of plastic that's coming into our system so that disposing of it has always been what we've focused on landfills and incinerators um, which are an issue for people who live around it but are also for people who live in the transportation routes the whole way through so it hurts everybody but it doesn't hurt everybody equally in terms of making it transporting it and disposing of it because if you think about where production uh, facilities are located where the highways go through and the neighborhoods also where landfills um, are located, landfills and incinerators are located, it certainly doesn't harm all of us equally. And um, so we, again, don't shy away from that in our conversations, in our, um, so we talk about, we, we go through and talk about um, all of this. And then of course, plastic litter. Um, our movie, Microplastic Madness, talks about, I guess, all of this. I mean, that's available for free and I'll give you a, a link to that. If you'd like to watch, it's a big pep um, and hopefully inspiration um, to doing this work. Um, so we know that plastic litter is not the end of the journey, that even we have a combined sewer overflow in New York City. It washes into the ocean or nearby body, bodies of water when it rains. Um, but it also combines in New York City and 
places with a combined sewer overflow into bodies of water with, um, you know, raw sewage from our homes. So um, we really um, are, you know, plastic litter is a big is a big problem with, with this. And then, of course, when it gets into our oceans, it breaks up into microplastics. And then, of course, the fish eat can eat it. And then we eat the fish. These are gifts from animations in our movie that help explain these sort of complicated ideas. And it makes everybody from third grade up until, um, you know, 93 can, you know, really understand it pretty clearly. But we also know that while some neighborhoods are more affected and some uh, populations and people are more affected by the manufacturing, the transportation and the elimination or the waste management of our plastics. Now, because of microplastics, we know that they're everywhere. And that is the great equalizer. That is the thing that we know that it's in our salt, water, beer, our waterways, our honey, but it's also in us. It's in our blood and our lungs and the maternal and fetal sides of placenta. So it is everywhere and we just have to, we have to get it stopped right now. So it's, um, and so we are proposing a plastic free lunch day. We had our first plastic free lunch day is featured in the movie Microplastic Madness, not to, not to spoil it, but um, it's still exciting to watch, even if you know it's coming. Um, but this fall, starting October 12th, which is that great, um, you're having a great uh, training on that day, uh, Eliza, um, but it's, it's, it's the first of, of many, because what we said with all of our students, all of our students said, um, oh my gosh, this is exciting, um, um, let's do more of them, let's do them every month or every week or every day, and so we're getting them monthly, so DOE said, yes, we'll do them every day, and then they also, students also said, why don't we just do it all across the US? And guess what? We're going to have a plastic free lunch day USA on November 2nd, as the movie kind of was a spoiler alert to that. So um, the, we're working with the Urban School Food Alliance. They're helping us sort of broadcast the event. They have an amazing um, PR um, firm who's working on you know, getting the word out. Um, and Dallas has already joined New York City. So on uh, November 2nd, we're trying to get other um, school school um, districts to join. So let's see. So we have some actions that you can do and that will be on our website, but you can ask if your school is not participating. So it's basically a little more than seven, maybe almost 800 schools that are elementary schools with um, cafeterias that don't have satellite cafeterias. So those elementary schools um, will automatically be participating in Cl Plastic Free Lunch Day, but there are things that if your green team or your class want to ask school food to do for that day, they can ask them to participate and really be change makers on a local level, which is, has a great feeling. Um, it's about eliminating, you could ask to eliminate condiment packets, um, straws, this is for nationwide, so we don't really have straws so much in New York City schools, but also sandwich wrappers. So there is a video that we've created, um, um, uh, donated to the Department of Education, and it teaches the school food staff how to make their, how to prepare their sandwiches without individually wrapping them. They're serving them with tongs and they're wrapped in bulk. Um, and so also we have uh, utensil packets on um, by request only. So we also have some materials to um, to share. We have this single use plastic search. And now thanks to Grow NYC's amazing photos. Thank you, Jackie. Um, we've been able to make photos because um, we tested this out last year during the first citywide plastic free lunch day in May. Um, and um, people were a little confused by the drawings. So we've added in photographs to make it more um, user friendly. For people who have, um, you know, if your printers aren't um, super um, friendly for um, printing the images, um, we do have the line drawings that you can use and we'll, we're, we're making a presentation to go over each of the items so that people are familiar with them. And that's really it. We also have a waste audit, which Grow and Waste has as well. The photos are coming in this one. Um, in the waste audit, um, you can actually um, check off, you know, count how many items are there. And so I know that's a little, some people feel daunted by that. But so again, you can watch Microplastic Madness, um, go to host a screening, and you can host it for free. Um, 
until definitely until October. And that's it. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and answer any questions if there's time. Thanks for bearing with me for all that. Yeah. Thank you, Rhonda, for sharing. That was amazing. Yeah. So we have about 10 minutes. So please um, raise your hand. Any questions, feel free to unmute or put them in the chat. I see Karen has her hand up. Thank you. Um, so I, I had put in the chat actually that one of my students came to me. Well, actually, not my student. I didn't even know him, but and said, "Why is why are our utensils and napkins packaged in plastic?" And I find it's the most annoying thing. So I'll often just say, "Get the food into the bin. Get the plate into the bin. Okay, forget the fork and and put it in the you know." But that's so annoying. It, oh, is there any, like he suggested like a cardboard container with holes to keep the um, fork from falling out. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Growing with CRD DOA wants to answer that. I'm, I mean, we have our thoughts about it, but maybe you guys want to have the official answer. <laughs> Eliza, do you want to, or, or Pat, that, um, well, I believe there's, I believe there's an effort to move towards not having a plastic wrapper around utensils. It takes time for all of these things to shift, but, um, and it seems so silly. It seems so easy to like, we've identified the problem. We know what the solution would be. Let's implement it. But um, I think we're in that middle phase of we've identified the problem. We know what the solution is. And it's, it's, um, uh, I, I believe that in, in, within a year or so, we will have um, a different um option for mm -hmm. uh for for utensils packaged in plastic for the in the meantime we really encourage pre-sorting at the table as part of our education with students and one of those things is opening up the packages and and um sort of just getting all the, the little soft plastic things that you need um on one side so that you can um just throw them away quickly and then um everything else going into the um organic spin so we just we just work that into anything that any of the tips that we're giving with students um the other benefit of encouraging students to open up packages is that they will eat the food i don't you know i don't know how many students are sitting there it's all interrelated nutrition mm -hmm. um, hunger health uh waste Mm -hmm. the climate, um, plastics, food waste, it's, it's, it's all interconnected, but there's so many students who sit there and can't open packages or won't open packages because they're busy talking during their 20, 25 minutes. And so we encourage opening of packages so that they can actually access the food and then easily um, separate those items up when they get to, to um, get rid of the items. There's a tricky thing in there. If it's a recoverable food and they really don't want it, then they shouldn't open the package. They should leave it sealed so that it can be recovered. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, these are all there's the, we pick our battles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Kate, for taking that. Yeah, that that's yeah. our official issue is that or the official message is that something's in the works. <laughs> yeah. um, great. Anyone, any other questions from the, the crowd? I'm getting the link for um, uh, hosting a screening. I'll put that. Up. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Well, this was great. Yeah. Very helpful. I, okay. I loved that. Um, was it Margaret, uh, shared the, um, wiggle while you sorted away song. Um, that's a classic. Yeah. Danielle <laughs> um, sent that for me. I asked for it. Yeah. yeah we get that stuck yeah. in our heads all the time. We're, we're, great. we're sitting at the office singing that song, but that's a great little, um, movement song for i'd say uh, as old as you want to go we love it but <laughs> but it probably probably peters out around second grade um but it's definitely good for those younger students um to get them singing and doing actions and participating and, and helping them to sort out those items i gave you the link for hosting a screening it's just cafeteriaculture.org host a screening and then um you can also just put it in the search and also plasticfreelunch.org. You can just keep um, checking back for that. We are getting, we're like in between meetings and setting stuff up for the fall. We're getting our materials um, updated from the spring and, um, and getting that all together. Um, Rhonda, I'm also seeing a question from Karen here about a video about helping school food with serving the sandwiches without plastic wrap. I remember there was a video that went out to OFNS last year 
there is know where we're at with that video there, there is a video and can i get, let me just see if i can um locate it and also yeah because it's great you can share that with your school food staff and some of them before plastic free lunch day last year some of our partner schools we said did you see this and they said no and so <laughs> i just brought a little ipad around and was like showing it to them because it gives them the it's a little longer it's still fun because atsuko makes really fun videos but um um, let me just see. I'm just going to keep looking and we can move on to another question if you want to or not while I'm finding it. Um, sure. I think that's all the questions I see in the chat. Does anybody else have any questions? I know there's been um, some talk in the chat about expansion happening in the Bronx. I see a couple of schools in the Bronx in there. Um, Danielle, I don't know if you want to talk to, you said something about the zero waste coordinators going out to schools. I don't know if you want to talk to that. You're muted, Danielle. Oh, you're muted, Danielle. Sorry, uh, I was going to share some more of our of our, our of our stuff, but um, yes, I was talking specifically to Bess, um, be Bess Metcalf because um, uh, you had said in the chat that your school does not have brown bins at the moment, and I just wanted to let you know that you are on the um the rollout for the fall, and meaning your school is, is Bess on the rollout for the fall. Uh, just PS seventy in the Bronx. I checked and I think they're there. Um, so I am really excited for you. And you should expect to hear from one of our um, engagement leads. Um, and, you know, I wish I could check everybody's school right now, but um, if you're in the Bronx, I can't. So if you're in the Bronx um, and you're in a public school, uh, it's very likely, and you don't have um, curbside composting already, you will be getting it, if not this fall, in the spring. So, um, and, and along with that comes uh, one of our newly hired and trained up and excellent um, um, education and engagement leads who will come to your school for at least 15, 12 to 15 weeks to get everybody started and to help folks with this rollout. We're, um, we're ready to go, we're pumped and ready to go. <laughs> And those, those leads will be going out uh, in the next week to do building walkthroughs just to get familiar with the building, meet with the custodial staff and um, assess all of the, the systems and the infrastructure and materials that are in place. And then within a week after that, we'll begin reaching out to um, uh, designated sustainability coordinators, the principals, um, and beginning to build up any contacts they can get within all of the schools. So we like to we like to get as many people on board. We know you as sustainability coordinators, I'm guessing most of you, that's your school-based role. Um, you're, you're not your school-based role. Your school-based role is probably a teacher or, or some other administrator, but that's a function that you've taken on in your schools. Um, and so uh, we look to as much as possible to build support for you and the work that you're doing in the school. So if you know of other teachers that have even an inkling of an interest in um, reducing waste in the school, we will look to work with you to help bring them on board. Great, thank you guys. There's one last question I see from Amy in the chat about strategies for um, actually encouraging students and staff to throw away their waste in the proper bins. I'm seeing a lot of resources from cafeteria culture. Oh, in there. I, put, uh, I put a lot of links because I just messed up the link. To begin I, um, with. But I also want to say that Grow this. Can I elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, please. Question. So we did have Grow, um, Grow NYC come with us, come to us for 12 weeks last year. It was unfortunately six of the weeks were during the surge and we didn't have our regular schedule. So it was a little hard, but we had a great uh, person come and we did workshops. I'm in a high school mm. compost. We did workshops for um, all of the staff in different ways and advisories, et cetera, et cetera. And it's still been like really a struggle. And our Grow NYC person talked to our custodial staff. It's still been like a huge struggle to actually, we haven't started it again this year. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the um, uh, sustainability coordinator and also faculty advisor to the Climate Change Club, Climate Justice Club. But it's really an uphill battle to get mm. people to reorient and actually just stop and think, where do things go, both in the cafeteria and in the classroom? Can I, can I just start really quickly? I just want to say that I think you can use those problems as a way to gather data. And I, Grow NYC has a great resource about sort of looking at, uh, which I'll let Kate speak to, but I want to also say that we like to gather data and this is your before data and you can say 
this is terrible sorting, but the worse it is before, the more opportunity you have to change it and to figure out what it is that's going to change it. And this can also help this data, like collecting, like this is how much contamination there was. If it's just pictures, if you sort set it out on a blue tarp, if you do weighing, this is what was wrong in the bin. However you decide to present the data, and I'm sure Kate and, and Danielle can talk about that, but however you decide to present the data, you can take that to your school food staff or to your custodial staff and see, see if you, if you set it up consistently every day, we wouldn't, we're going to, we'd like to try this and see if this will work. Will you be part of our, um, our test pilot? Or you can say to school food, could you try not giving us uh, packets? Because you can just collect data on, on uh, sauce packets, ketchup packets, mustard packets, dressing, and say, could you just give it to us in a dispenser? That's available at OFNS. They have that to, to order. They could order that and just put it in a squeeze bottle or they put it on the tray themselves. And then you could see what the difference is for sorting because it's hard it's so easy for us to blame each other for not sorting properly, but there's so many factors for why we don't sort properly, not the least of which is we have too much single use plastic in our lunches. So, um, well, well, what I was going to ask is, um, first of all, change is slow. And so uh, I want to encourage you and let you know that, uh, you know, sometimes it takes longer than 12 weeks or six weeks to make these kind of the, the kind of changes that we want to see and that you are really, really trying to see in your cafeteria. So um, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, what kind of help do you have? Because I'm thinking about um, because change is slow and because change can be kind of a big thing. And like Rhonda is saying, you, there's so many different ways that you can attack the problem, uh, but you also need to have people to help you, right? So um, if you have the capacity, I would suggest getting some help. I, I don't know what's going on in your building. Uh, I, need, I could speak to the person who worked in your building last week, but it sounds like you need more than six weeks and that you guys have definitely had some disruptions. So if you've got a school sustainability council, or if you're able to um, you know, ask three other people to join you and split the work up, then you guys can start to think about, okay, let's attack this tiny low hanging fruit um, first, and then let's move up. And I think it's really important that your principal, who uh, I, I don't know how that person feels about waste, but it'd be really great if they can set the tone in the building, right? Um, and then also understanding that schools are dealing with a lot of different problems, right? So I'm, I'm opening it further out beyond your school. They're experiencing a lot of different problems and sometimes have a reduced capacity to address some of these problems. And, you know, when I was in the, in the field, I would get frustrated often with schools that just didn't seem to be able to move in the direction I wanted them to move in. And then I had to sort of take a step back and sort of think about what is this school actually dealing with? You know, what are their specific challenges? Is it a communication issue? Is it a, uh, is it, is it something more serious than that? Maybe the, uh, the folks who are supposed to be moving the bins out aren't literally just aren't doing it. Or is it that the principal hasn't set the tone or doesn't understand what their role is, right? Or maybe we need to take a more grassroots approach to this problem and hand, and go to individuals uh, um, in the in in the school food uh, location, or you know what I mean. So it's about it's about like first of all, um, connecting with other people so that you're not the lone person. It's really hard to push schools forward when you're the lone person. I'm gonna toss to Kate because I'm sure she's gonna have some more to add to your question. I've been waiting to jump in, but thanks. I think I think Danielle got some really good things in there, and I just know it's time for everyone to start popping off, and so I don't want to talk for too much longer. But I want to plug one thing that we are looking to do. Um, probably in a, starting in about a month is do some one-on-one -on -one sessions or some sort of like, um, uh, we do virtual sessions um, through Grow and YC, through our zero waste schools. We just do virtual sessions for schools, but we're going to do sort of more of an open office hour I thing this year so that we can spend 20 minutes with people that really want to have some in-depth conversations about their specific issues in their schools. And then just this sort of goes to what Danielle was saying, but it is hard year over year to maintain the change that happens in schools because schools, is, schools are just... Um, places of change, like it, it always happens. And so institutionalizing um, everything that you do so that like it's just on the calendar for the first year, the first day of school, there's an announcement made and everyone knows that waste stations are gonna be set up and having that institutionalized. Um, so the principal knows that it's something that has to be a reminder sent to 
um, teachers or to, um, to custodial stuff. So it just gets off on the right foot. Um, it's a really big thing. And that's what we work to do to, um, when we're, we're trying to get our um, both student leadership and school leadership um, up in schools. We try to make sure that they're left with a plan that institutionalizes waste sorting so that it's something that's thought of because people just don't, waste is there because people aren't thinking about it and they don't want to think about it. And we just want to make sure it's something on the checklist that people are thinking about. As we know, all of you are. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, so many good points that you all brought up. Um, yeah, I just put some in the chat. But yeah, I love all these great ideas about understanding the problem, looking at the data, connecting with people in your school, trying to create a better system around it, institutionalizing it. All really good points. Thank you all so much for coming today. Rhonda, thank you for coming. Nicholas, Kate, Daniil, thank you for sharing your knowledge, all your programs, all your resources. It was amazing to have you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be sending out the recording, the presentations, all the links, all the extra links you guys added in. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank you guys for presenting. And uh, we can't wait to, you know, get the ball rolling with all of our sustainability and waste reduction and climate action this year. So you guys are the ones that make it happen. Thank you for coming and um, have an awesome day. Thanks, Eliza. Thanks, Eliza. Well done. Thank you everyone Thanks for, for coming. coming. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank you all for all that you're doing. Woo. Oh yeah. Bloop, bloop, bloop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye guys. I'm going to be ending the presentation, but thank you so much for coming. If you have more questions, please reach out to us and um, I will have everyone's email in the follow-up email too. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye Rhonda. Bye. Bye Nicholas. Bye. Bye guys.